a Nobel laureate once said, the beauty of research is that you never know where it's going to lead. And indeed, when I started back in 2011, I never imagined that in a few years' time, I would be standing giving a TED talk about my experience with research. So my story began in November 2011. I was a biology pre-medical student back then, and I remember we were having few guests from a southern Lebanese village at home. And I entered the living room to say hi. I sat alongside a man who had his little daughter sat in his lap. We're going to call him Ahmed. Ahmed was a 28-year-old man, he was married, he was a farmer, and he has this one little daughter child. What was striking about Ahmed was that he had lost his right arm and had a patch covering his right eye. Now, throughout the night, we chatted, and I got to know him a bit more. But my sense of curiosity could not resist asking him, so what happened? He choked up a bit and said, it's all because of the damned figs. I lost them while picking figs. Now, I was confused. I did not understand. How can someone lose an arm and an eye while picking figs? So he followed it up instantly with, I'm the victim of cluster munitions. He explained to me that after the, to the, after the 2006 war, he was walking in his garden and he wanted to pick a fig. So it happened that a submunition was set on the tree. So when he pulled the fruit, it triggered the submunition to explode. And the next thing he remembers was waking up in the hospital with, with one arm and one eye. I remember his cute little daughter pulling my shirt and telling me, my daddy is a pirate. And it, it was really a shock for me. Like, I had heard of, sub, of cluster munitions and submunitions being scattered after the 2006 Lebanon war, but I never saw its human impact this close. Now, for, the, for those of you who do not know, cluster munitions are a type of large weapons. They open in mid-air and release and scatter widely numerous smaller submunitions or bombs. What is unique about cluster munitions is that the bombs, the small ones, the submunitions, they usually number in the hundreds and even the thousands at times. And more importantly, they have a high failure rate, which means that there is up to 40% chance that these smaller submunitions will not explode upon impact. After the 2006 war, the Human Rights Watch estimated that more than 4 million submunitions were released over Lebanese soil and one million of which remained unexploded. So when people were returning back to their homes and lands in the post-war time, they were encountering these submunitions in their daily lives, and accidents were happening. I could not take Ahmed's story out of my, out of my head for three consecutive nights. I could not sleep. And I thought, I felt that I needed to do something about it. And because I come from an academic background, with both of my parents being professors and researchers, I thought that maybe I should do my own research on the topic. And when I found out that the medical literature had scarce information about injuries because of cluster munitions, I decided that I would start and conduct my own research on this. So I, I did a multi-level project. I explored anatomical, neurological, and psychological effects of cluster munitions. And I was hoping that by shedding light on the effects of these detrimental weapons, that an action will be taken to limit or even prohibit the use of these detrimental weapons in the future. After getting the appropriate approvals, I dedicated all my spare time just for data collection, interviewing victims and their families, and filling up questionnaires. Early on, in the data collection phase, primary care physicians who were having first-hand encounters with these victims corroborated to us that they were having difficulties in 
determining the level of injuries of the submunition victims. They reported that the injuries were polytraumatic, which means that multiple systems in the body were damaged at the same time. And this was affecting the diagnosis and the plan of care of the patients. And injuries were, va were various, like there were head injuries, upper and lower limb amputations, thoracic and abdominal injuries, and more importantly, long-term psychological distress. So, after two years of extensive research on the topic, I finally co-developed the first scale of injuries due to cluster munitions to address this, pro this problem. And the first scale works by measuring the functional impairment in victims. I believe that if maybe we can stratify the cohort based on the disability or the limitation in activity that is being caused by the submunition, this will help in the diagnosis. And it did. It helped in the diagnosis and it helped in providing the best possible treatment for these victims. Now, after months of hard work and research, my first paper was ready for submission. I was very excited. This is my first paper to be published and after it I will become a published researcher. And more importantly, I felt that this will be my contribution to the betterment of humanity, that the voices of people like Ahmed will finally be heard and the effects will be known and possibly this would help in doing something about this issue. Three weeks later, the paper was rejected. And this was my first rejection letter. And it was a shock. I was disappointed. I felt that my work was not appreciated and I felt that the voices of these people, of these victims, will not be heard and the effects will not be known. However, I remembered how Ahmed, despite all of his agony, he was always smiling. So I decided to not lose hope and I did not give up. I resubmitted again and again. After seven months of submissions to eight journals, I finally received the five words that would make any scientist happy. Your manuscript has been accepted. So, I was ecstatic. I was so happy. This was my first paper to be published, and finally my message was out. I remember meeting with Ahmed that year, and I handed him the article. He read the title and he went briefly through the pages and then he looked up at me and said, now I'm a happy pirate. So, later that year, I had arranged a research internship at McGill University in Canada with the renowned professor Rolando Del Maestro. Over there, I had a completely different experience with research. The goals of research were different, the facilities, the doctor-student relationship, and most importantly, the mentor-mentee relationship. With Professor Del Maestro, it was the first time who I met, that I met someone other than my father who treated me like his son. He showed me how important mentorship can be and how inspiring it can be. This experience contributed to my personal and professional uh, development. On an academic level, I learned how to analyze complex data on my own, how to write better manuscripts, how to target appropriate, appropriate journals, and how to address editors and reviewers' needs. And on a personal level, Dr. Del Maestro used to emphasize the importance of remaining humble no matter what I achieve. And when I returned back to Lebanon, I was adamant to use my new set of skills in the cluster munition project, which was far from over. And our group ended up publishing six original articles on cluster munitions and we became the most published group on cluster munitions in the world. And today, I have more than 40 publications in international peer-reviewed journals in various disciplines. Global health, conflict medicine, neuroscience and neurosurgery. And the Faris scale became a worldwide reference 
for classifying injuries because of cluster munitions. And most recently, my perspective on how to deal with cluster munitions as a global health hazard has been accepted by the Bulletin of the World Health Organization and will be published very soon. As a result of all of this, I was selected by Forbes to be in a Forbes 30 under 30 list for science and healthcare, which usually includes the 30 most inspiring young individuals in the world who are changing the world in what they do and are under 30 years of age. And I became the first ever Lebanese physician to be inducted into this prestigious list. So, my message is this. Each and every one of us was created for a purpose. Whatever that purpose is, let it be of benefit to humanity. Because being of benefit to humanity is the right thing to do by instinct and the smart thing to do because it will take you places. Thank you.